church of the Laodiceans write these things said <clears throat> the amen the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God I know thy works thou art neither cold nor hot I would that thou wert cold or hot so then because <coughs> thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, tonight for this chance to be together again in your house. For your word, or for this study as we continue to work our way through. Or oh, we're thankful that uh, we can still come together as believers. Study your word, pray, sing, worship, or without fear. Uh, realizing, Lord, that uh, that may not always be the case. So may we not take these times for granted. We pray for those who could care less about your church, who claim to be members of your church, 
and yet care nothing about it. Pray, Lord, that you would uh, <coughs> open their eyes, move in their lives. Lord, I, I just have a hard time. I can't find a better place to be than to be right here with your spirit and your people. And I, I just I have a hard time understanding any other way. So, Lord, I just pray that you would help me to Lord, be the kind of witness I should be to make a stand for you like I should. And Lord, allow your Holy Spirit to work and that it, uh, Lord, will move hearts. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we are to the seventh church. We have gone through Ephesus, the church that had lots of works but it left its first love. Smyrna, the persecuted church, the first church that didn't have anything uh, negative said about it by Jesus. Pergamos, the church that would mix in the world by a power that allowed uh, uh, a Jezebel, as was named, and tolerated her within the church. Sardis, uh, uh, representative of, of, of the Protestants and how they took off and then slowly made their way away from where they should be. Our last one, Philadelphia, the faithful church that was the second and only uh, other church besides Smyrna that did not really have anything negative said about it. Each church <coughs> named and consequently representative of that name as we went through. For example, like Pergamos was a perverted marriage of the world and the church, and it was named Pergamos, which meant perverted marriage. Philadelphia, uh, a brotherly love a loving church, an open door that started the idea of present-day missions as we have now. Each one, not only a physical church at the time that that letter was written to, but also a representation of a church age as it has gone through from the beginning of Ephesus being the first church into Smyrna, the persecuted church of the early church, and then into uh, Catholic Church becoming the church of the world per se and then what happened as the Catholics came in charge and corruption followed then the Protestants which followed that uh, our last one the, the modern day missionaries and, and missionary efforts of the church but not only has it been in order not only has each name been representative of that city and of that church and of that people and of what they would be in the church age. Uh, Brock, were you able to get that picture up? Yes. All right, let's see. I put Brock on the spot. I see his cursor moving. That's good. I just got a little, just a, an easy picture of, there we go, thank you, Brock, of where they fell in modern day Turkey and you'll notice that they're in order in a circle Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamos to Thyatira to Sardis to Philadelphia to Laodicea not only are they in order of church age they're in order geographically within Asia Minor, or again, as we said, modern day <coughs> Turkey. Do, do you think that is just a coincidence? God is amazing in how He does things. Well, beyond anything we could think of, make up, or concoct. And for people who say, oh, you know, that's just a bunch of made up fables and stories, well, it'd be hard to make that geographical circle. And make it representative of the church age in order chronologically. Also make those cities fit the definition of what they are after the fact. Because it wasn't. It was preordained in history by a sovereign God who knew exactly what he was doing. And so as we go around the circle, we get to the farthest south now. Uh, Laodicea. Laodicea. Now, you'll notice... If brought now we go back to that first verse of the text it is a little different than what they are have been saying 
3.14. Brock, uh, if you would, 3.14. There we go. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Well, that sounds like what he's been saying, but it's not. So far in every church, if you look back, you would say, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis, of the angel of the church in Philadelphia. He doesn't say unto the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the only one that's referenced this way. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. If so that's just, it's just a different way to say it. Well, I would say, yeah, it's just a different way to say it, but why would he say it six times one way? And on the last one, say it a different way. And if we get to looking at what's going on in this church, speculation amongst people a lot smarter than me, are that maybe it really wasn't even in fact a church because it really wasn't a group of born-again believers that were doing what they were supposed to do, but maybe a church in name only. Like we got Republicans in name only when you start talking about politics. Maybe it was a church in name only. Now, is that true? Is that what it means? No, that's not what it doesn't say that. But it's interesting. And each time we've gone through these, the introduction to each church has been uh, significant and a, and a purpose behind it. So we have a difference here. And we got Laodicea. Now, that word means something. Leo is, we've covered this already in doing the seven churches. Because there's been twice in the seven churches where the doctrine of the Micah Laetans is mentioned. Leia in Laetans is the same Leia in Laodicea. And it means the lay, the people, the people, us, the people. So Leia. Then Decea. It means kind of the same word we use in English. Decision. The people with decision. The people who make the decisions. As we get into this, we'll see the church at Laodicea had become a church of people who made their own decisions about what was right and what was wrong and did not consider what the Bible said or what the holy standard was. When people become their own master, problems will ensue. When people become their own gods, set their own rules, set their own standards, they will by nature become corrupt and sinful because they will make okay the things that they do wrong because they like doing them wrong. And they will call the things they don't like wrong because they don't have to worry about that because they don't do them. So it makes sense. Again, everything fitting together. Laodicea, the people of decision or the people who decide. And that's nothing new. That's been going on. You can go back to Judges. You remember Judges? In Judges, there's no king. What the people want? They want a king. People say, hey, I know a little bit more than God. I'm a little bit smarter. I think I know what's better for me than he does. I said, well, that's stupid. It happens all the time now. There are times in your life when you make a decision, although the Lord's leading you a different way, because you think in your mind it should be this way, and you're smarter than he is, although you won't say it, that's exactly what you're doing. You know what, when we do that, we do that because I am the same, it never turns out like it's supposed to, does it? Never turns out quite like it's supposed to be. So, the Laodiceans, you know, when people began to make decisions about doctrine and such, you get into problems. If you'll notice today, because of highly politicized everything, and because of just our country and its nature, many of our denominations now, they have committees, they have conventions, they vote on things, they make decisions regarding what they believe and how they believe, and many times that decision comes to a vote among the people, and the Bible is not considered when it would be just easy to say, hey, we'll just do what the Bible says, and that will make it right. But too many people now believe that ah, things are different now, we're just a little bit smarter, so we can make some 
decisions because we know more now than they knew then. Well, you better be careful when you start saying you know more than Jesus or you know more than God, who is the same. I'll give you an example. Again, hot topic we bring up all the time. But having gays in the church, preachers, priests, leadership roles within the church, oh, should that be or should not that be? Well, how about it's an abomination in the sight of God? So I think the Bible says clearly it should not be. But we have groups of people who will vote and say, oh, you know what, I think that's okay because that's the society we live in today. Watch out. As we get into now, big into politics, big in the news, what's going to happen on the abortion side? And you have groups of religious people who get together and decide, well, do we think it's okay or not okay? Well, hey, how about just go back to the original Ten Commandments and thou shalt not kill. Is that not simple enough? Is it not simple enough? Well, again, once you start letting people get involved, and deciding what is right in the eyes of man as opposed to what's right in the sight of God, you're going to get problems. And everybody says, <coughs> amen. Amen. Well, how about amen? What's he say here? These things saith the amen. When do you say amen? When you agree with something and when else? At the end of a prayer. That's exactly what it's saying here. These things say the amen. Capital A, Jesus Christ. He's the end of the sentence. He's the end of the subject. He's the end all be all. And you might as well agree because he is right on everything. There's a purpose in saying these things say the amen. Not only is he the final word on everything. Not only is he always right and on the right side. He is the faithful and true witness. That word witness is the same word we get the word martyr from. Someone who is killed or dies for the cause of Christianity. Well, we know he died for your cause and my cause and our sins on the cross. So yes, he is the faithful and true witness, the faithful and true martyr. And he is the beginning of the creation of God because as we know, the birth of Jesus as a human was just the beginning of him as fully man. He was fully God before time began and before there ever was anything else. There was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, let's move on to verse 15 quickly. I'm already going slower than I mean to. I know thy works. We've heard that before. Almost every church we've had this phrase. I know thy works. Well, how's he going to Describe the works of Laodicea. You're neither cold nor hot. You're neither one side or the other. You're neither fully cold or fully hot. And then he says this, I would that thou wert cold or hot. I wish you were one or the other. Then we get the famous verse 16 that we all know that describes Laodicea. So be it, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Think about things cold and hot that you like. I, I throw a couple out. Tea. I like sweet tea. Don't ain't supposed to drink it, but I like it. I like my sweet tea cold. I want it over ice. I don't like coffee, but I like hot tea. I can drink hot tea. But I like it hot if I'm going to drink hot tea. I don't like my hot tea not hot and just lukewarm. I don't like my sweet tea not cold and just lukewarm. Either one of those it ends up being the same, actually. But I don't like it that way. Don't like it little more. Either want it hot as hot tea or want it cold like sweet tea. How about chocolate milk? I like it really cold or I like it hot, hot chocolate. If you've got room temperature chocolate milk, I'm not drinking it because I'm going to get sick if it don't make me sick. But give it to me cold or give it to me hot. Well, 
Same idea. She said, I wish she was either cold or hot. Full in one way, full in the other. Since you're not, we know this verse. I'll spew. Let's, let's think about that spew for a second. Well, they say, well, it's amazing. You put something in your mouth, you like it, you spit it out. He doesn't say, I'll spit it out. He said, I'll spew it out. There's a difference in spew and spit. So what is spew? <coughs> Closest thing that's still not there yet, that I have used that word before, is somebody that's got a mouthful of drink, or food, but most times it's drink, and somebody says something funny at the table, and they start trying to laugh, and they got a mouthful of drink, and they're trying to hold it in, they can't hold it in, and you'll hear somebody say, they're going to spew. And it just comes out. Because that's a little more violent than just voluntarily spitting it out. But that's not even what this spew means. This spew means the actual act of regurgitation. This is vomiting. This is throwing up. And this is not like I had a kid one time on a, an away game in Monroeville, Alabama, throw up in the back of the van and nobody ever knew it. And I, how in the world, is, with 15 girls in the van, a girl can throw up nobody knows it. This is throwing up like Robbie does, where people down on 2nd on Street hear him. I've heard about you throwing up, Robbie. And trust me, I'm the same way. Everybody in Eastern Valley in McCauley hears me when I'm throwing up. That's what this is. I am spewing you out. I am throwing you up. I am violently projectile vomiting you out of my mouth. That's a, that's a very descriptive verse. But now go back and remember who he's talking about. He's talking about a group of Christians, we think, in the church. How would you, again, I've said it every time, put Shannon Baptist Church in each one of these. How would you hate to be known as the church that Jesus said, I put you in my mouth and you make me vomit. You make me sick to my stomach. That's an awful, awful thing that's being said about this church. The Leo the Seeds. Well, give me a little background real quick that will help this verse and a further verse. Again, we had the map Leo to see up to further south as you go around. And it was near another famous or larger city at the time, Hierapolis. Now, Laodicea, there are still rumors every day. There's archaeological sites you can go. There are still places set up. It was a big, thriving, rich, wealthy city. It had a stadium. It had a gymnasium. It had all this stuff that at the time was very modern. And there are still ruins of it there today. You, you, you can go and see it. It was known for a few things. One of the things it was known for was medicine, and that's going to come up here in just a minute. It was known for its wool. It was known for being wealthy. It was so wealthy that just a little bit north of Laodicea was Hierapolis. Hierapolis was known for having hot springs. Really, really hot spring water coming up from the earth. Most of the time, springs, as we know, around right here, if you find a spring, it's really, really cold. You like spring water, it tastes good, it's cold. Well, there are also hot springs, like hot springs of Arkansas, like where FDR would go and, and there were some medicinal ideas behind the, the, the warm waters of a hot spring. Well, Laodicea said, hey, we want those hot springs down here and use that hot water. So they actually spent the money and built an aqueduct to bring the hot spring water from Hierapolis down to Laodicea. But here's the problem. I think they'd have been smart enough to figure this out. When you put hot water and you bring it down six miles to your city, by the time it gets to your city, guess what? It ain't hot no more. It's lukewarm. They knew the background and what Jesus meant here. That was a big blight on their city, a big black eye that they had actually tried this, not even thinking, hey, that's not going to work because it's not going to be hot when it gets down there. So, again, Jesus uses a perfect illustration to a perfect thing that had happened to this city and this group of people. They kind of understood the idea of not being hot 
being lukewarm instead. Move to verse 17 if you would, Brock. This is really an indictment on them. Because thou sayest, I'm rich. Increase with goods. Because they were. They were a very wealthy city. Thus the people within the church, wealthy people. And have need of nothing. But you don't even know. You don't even realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's all. You think you're full, but you're really empty. That's a bad situation to be in and an awful indictment on a church of Christians who are supposed to be serving the Lord and spreading the gospel. Any of you ever had a vehicle where your gas gauge didn't work? You had to just guess? You ever run out of gas? And think, I thought I, I, thought I had more in there than that. Some of y'all ain't poor enough to have done that. I've done I've, I've had where I ain't got no gas gauge. And I've run out of gas before. And in my mind, I'm like, I, I, I bought plenty. That thing's supposed to be full. I don't understand why I have sputtered out of gas. The Laodiceans thought they were full. They were really empty. They thought they had everything going. When in actuality, they didn't have anything going. Spiritually, they thought they were full and rich. Spiritually, they were empty and poor. As we look at the modern day church in America today, I'm afraid we're getting more and more churches, groups of people named churches that are spiritually empty and spiritually poor, but putting out the advertisement, the idea, the picture that they're spiritually full and spiritually rich. And again, all of that leads to catastrophe. So, Laodiceans, not cold, not hot. Lukewarm, makes Jesus want to vomit. Think they're all of that and they are nothing. Think they're full and they're empty. Think they're rich, but they're poor. Verse 18, Brock, Jesus begins to tell them what to do. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Now, get this idea. Gold tried in the fire. We've heard that before. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, talks about our works. Works that last in judgment and works that won't last in judgment. You remember? He says, you have works of gold, silver, precious stones. When they're put in the fire and brought back out, they're still gold, silver, precious stones. But if you build your works of wood, hay, and stubble, you put them in the fire, you come back with ashes because they burn up. Jesus is telling the other sins here, hey, you don't need wood, hay, stubble. Come get gold. Come do the things that will last. Have the works that will stand in the day of judgment. Remember, we won't stand in judgment to God, although we like to use that picture, and, I, and I'm the world's worst. I've used it before as a preacher. Of, we're going to stand before Jesus, and yes, you're saved, you know your laws, and you're going to heaven, you're going to hell. That's not the judgment. There'll be a judgment of the dead where they're all condemned and go to hell. Our judgment as Christians will just be to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll give an account of the deeds done in our body, whether they be good or bad. All our works will be tried by fire. And we'll either have some gold, silver, precious stone, and unfortunately a bunch of us, including myself, will have too many of wood, hay, stubble that just burn up and ain't no good. But we'll stand before that judgment seat in front of Jesus Christ. Here he's telling the Lord this. Get you some things that will last like gold. He just bypasses the precious stones and the silver. You need to get some works that are gold. You need some white raiment, clean, spiritually clean, 
pure ivory soap, 99 and 44, 100%. You need to get some clean, pure, holy works in your life and begin to do the things that will last. And then again, we get this last one. It's home. They ever see it was known as kind of a, a place where medicine was tested, proved, worked, used quite a bit. They would understand this last phrase. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve. Quite sure they ever see it had several different kinds of eye salve that were used as medicine used in that day by the people there because again it was a wealthy place and things like that were found and used in cities like that so that idea of the eye salve on the blind eyes to help them be able to see was something that also fit with this city and its background would you go to verse 19 as many as i love I rebuke and chase and be zealous therefore and here has been the key to every one of the church's problems as we look through these churches repent confess and turn the other way verse 20 right behold I stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door I will come into him and he will sup and will sup with him and he with me I've mentioned this before in passing We've heard this verse all our life. We love this verse. We often use this verse as an invitation to a lost person to be saved. But remember, again, now is there a question as to whether this is really a, a true church, whether it's really got true saved people in it? Yes, but Jesus doesn't say that. It's just the beginning of that and how it's phrased, and it does have these problems. But he is writing to a church Seven churches in Asia. This is to a church. This is to a group of people who are supposed to be saved. This is not an invitation to lost people. The whole I stand at the door and knock is to Christians. So you say, oh, well, yeah, I always thought that was to lost people. It's not. It's to, it's to a church. But what a sad story. What a sad indictment to say that Jesus is not in your church and he's standing outside knocking and wants to come in. If you'll just let him in. Do you know how many churches met today and Jesus didn't come in the door? And we wonder, you know, why churches get such a bad name. It's because there's so many churches that have nothing to do with Jesus anymore. Have nothing to do with the Bible anymore. And again, hey, I'm all for modern amenities. That's all good. There's a lot of churches met today. They had a coffee shop. Everybody got them a donut. Nice, good, hot cup of coffee. The coffee wasn't lukewarm. Didn't make nobody spew. It was all good. The climate was just right. The lights got turned down low. The fog came up. The screens came on. The music was great. The preacher told you how good you were. Everybody went out and whoo, it was a great day. And if you ask them, what was the scripture? Unfortunately, some will say, what is scripture? And not even know. Now, oh, preacher, we in a little church. You talk about preachers. No, I, little churches like that too. We got screens too. I'm just saying, there's a lot of things going on in groups of people that claim to be a church that have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And Laodicea apparently was one of them because he was standing at the door knocking to come in, to get inside and ask him to come. All right, Brock, would you go to the next one? To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. And then the last verse that we've had at each one, he that hath near let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Time's gone, but I want to throw this out. Boy, I dread this because Brady's here tonight. I got this quick little historical thing I want to throw out there, and Brady's going to have to correct me if I'm wrong on this. So I'm going to go really fast. That way I don't, he don't have time for me to catch me at the end. But again, each one of these has tied into a church age or a time of the church and fit what was going on all the way from Ephesus all the way up through Philadelphia and missions. We get to this one. This idea again of the people voting or the people deciding what's right instead of what the Bible says what the Holy Spirit tells you or what God says. And 
A little interesting development within the church around 1500 with Henry VIII. You heard of Henry VIII? He's the guy that's got all the wives, right? He's one killed some wives, divorced some wives, that guy. Well, we're not going to go through all that, but as a young boy, his brother wants to be the next king. His brother dies. When his father dies, he becomes the king. The church tells him he needs to marry the widow of his brother that was going to be the king, Catherine. So he does what the church says he marries. Like, you know, hey, I don't really like Catherine. I want to get this marriage to no, I want to divorce her. I want to put her away. I want to get my own wife. The church says, no, you can't do it. One thing the Catholic Church said, and still believes today, hey, not going to divorce her. So, long story short, guess what? King Henry VIII does. Makes up his own church. Pulls out the Catholic Church. Begins what turns into the Anglican Church or the Church of England. Gets his own priest that will say, hey, it's okay if you divorce people. It's okay if you do that. He kind of becomes the head of it. He kind of makes the rules up as he goes. That church would, in turn, become in America the church that we call the Episcopalians. Is it any wonder it was the Episcopalians that first came into the, hey, let's go in gay priests and preachers and let's, let's have that. I think that'd be all right. Well, the idea of being able to decide what you think's right started way back with how the church started. Did I get close, Brady, in a really fast thing? Okay, good. Yeah, you, you can get on to the rest of it when you get out. Thank you for that nod. But that idea, which has fed into what's happened here in our country in the last 200 years, or the last 100 years maybe, of liberalism, relativism within the church. The idea of everything's relative, there is no real truth. Well, yes, there is. It's called the Bible. But that idea of no real truth within society has crept its way into churches, into denominations, into groups of people. Because it's, it's been taught. We talked about this. All your great big Ivy League schools started out as seminaries, as places that taught the Bible and theology. Now they're the furthest thing from that. <laughs> the idea that, hey, you decide what's right. There's no absolute truth for <laughs> You decide that. Well, hey, now, guess what? That is exactly opposite of what the Bible says. We don't decide what's right and wrong. God has decided, and it's set within us, and we know it. We just change it when it doesn't fit the definition we want it to. When we're married to Catherine, but we think Mary's a lot prettier, we want to go with Mary. Same ideas. Same things. Representative of where we got gotten as a people and as a church. But boy, I didn't have anything in those verses that describe Laodicea ever describe Shannon Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. I'd rather be Philadelphia, not be Laodicea. Well, let's think. We made it through the seven churches. We did it in seven services. Who'd have thought? I thought it'd take more. And uh, now we're going to really get into some hard stuff as we begin moving out of that. Because that's the only part of Revelation I've ever preached for is in the seven churches. So we're fixing to really jump off into stuff that I ain't ever wanted to do nor done. So this will be exciting. Brad, would you come while we have a verse of invitation?
Little in. Doesn't matter. It's have thine own way, Lord. The Bible's not Burger King. You don't get it your way. You get it his way. Amen. Bless this man. Brother Barry, would you